Thank you, Zarko. Hello, everybody. I don't speak any Serbian, so I'm going to speak in English. Uh, so I want to talk uh, today about what we, the biggest issue that's been going on in DNS throughout 2019, and that's about applications doing their own DNS. In the traditional model of DNS, DNS is 34 years old now, and for 34 years we've been pretty much doing the same thing. We've been sending clear text queries, primarily over UDP, in a re resolution model that stayed pretty much static until recently. As a user with a device, your stub resolver sitting on your device connects to a recursive resolver that gets the answers that you need. Thank you. And those recursive resolvers are what we're going to primarily talk about today. These are typically run by your ISP, or if you're at a university as a student or staff, the university is running the recursive resolver. If you're in a company, especially in a large one, the enterprise is running the recursive resolver. And this works. It's worked for 34 years. It's worked for a number of reasons, but some of the things that this model meets well are things like regulatory compliance, Governments need information sometimes. Government police need information sometimes. And they're able to get what they need from recursive resolver operators fairly easily. There are governments in this world that restrict DNS queries. Certain words you can't use in certain countries that they either tell the recursive resolver operator to block or to change, redirect it. Or sometimes they don't do any of that, they just say, we just want you to log those queries for those certain words. And the government requires this, so they do it. And it works. It works fine. These, these, our service providers also often want to protect us. They want to protect us from going to sites we shouldn't be going to. They put types of malware protection, and they do it in the DNS. It's the easiest place to do it. This whole thing works in public DNS. Over the last number of years, recursive resolution has moved slowly away from this traditional service provider model into a central DNS model. We have all these quads, quad eight, quad one, quad nine. In Taiwan, it's quad 101. And there's many, many others. There are a lot, there are hundreds of public DNS operators. This model works. It turns out, Governments can still serve legal process on public DNS operators, and they abide by it. Malware protection. Well, we're going to hear in a little bit from Quad9. John Todd is here to talk about us, Quad9. It's actually, malware protection is actually a value offering for Quad9. They purposely block sites so that you can't go there when you set it as your recursive resolver. And this is a good thing. But this entire model has a little bit of a security concern. We're sending queries over clear text. Anyone listening on the wire, anyone doing any type of passive monitoring can see not just the queries that we make. Hey, I want to go to www.foo. Well, they not only see that me, David, went to www.foo on such a time and such a date, but they're also getting my metadata. They're seeing information about my computers, about my devices, about things that are connected to my search. Now, a lot of end users who are looking for more privacy say, you know what? I can buy myself a lot of privacy if I just tunnel everything through an encrypted VPN. If I use a VPN, the bad guys or the government or whoever can't see what I'm doing. The problem is VPNs only encrypt the channels they choose to encrypt. And if you look at popular VPN products, one of the channels that's often unencrypted is port 53. So there's a tremendous amount of data leaking out of VPN sometimes, and the DNS data critically can leak out of certain VPN products. So one takeaway, if you like to use a VPN, please take a moment tomorrow and make sure that the VPN product you're using is actually encrypting port 53. And the point here is that it's the DNS queries that come from our devices on our stub resolvers to the recursive resolvers that are the most vulnerable to intercept. They're the most vulnerable to us losing our privacy. So there's a pretty obvious solution to, to this, and that's to encrypt. 
So over the last few years, the IETF has standardized uh, two encryption technologies for DNS. DNS over TLS, DOT, and DNS over HTTPS, DO. DOT is um, a really simple design. It takes advantage of TLS to encrypt the transport channel between the stub resolver and the recursive resolver. Nicely, it's built to run on port 853. It's got its own port instead of port 53. This is really good for service providers because anyone who's operating the network, you can see the traffic and you can deal with it however you want because it has its own port. DOT is usable by pretty much any application because almost every application today uses TLS. The biggest implementation I know of of DOT is Android. Android 9 and now Android 10. Um, they don't have it on by default, but it's an option. You can set it up in your network stack to use DNS over TLS to a TLS resolver. And then there's DOE, and that's really what we're going to be talking about for the next 15 minutes. And what I want to do is, just for a moment, I want to separate what the goal of DOE was when they designed the protocol versus how it's been implemented. From a protocol standpoint, DOE is actually quite good. The whole purpose of it is to figure out who do you trust. So I run my family's finances. I take all of our money and I have to manage it. So I put the money in a bank. And I chose a bank in Canada that I really like. So I put all of my family's money into that bank. Not a, because I trust them. I've chosen to trust them. Not only do I trust that money, that bank, to hold my family's money, I trust them so much that I get on my phone or my computer and I actually do digital banking with them. And that's kind of a dumb thing to do if you think about it, because our connections really aren't all that secure. But I trust them enough that I'll go ahead and do online banking with them and trust them. If something happens, if somebody somehow captures my login credentials and they try and take my money, that the bank will make good at it and put the money back. So if I trust this company, this bank in Canada, to put all my, all my family's money into it, and if I trust them enough to do digital banking with them, maybe it's the bank I should trust to do recursive resolution for me. Maybe if the bank sets up a DNS server and I use them for recursives, I can trust that they're not going to do anything with it, that information, the query data and the metadata, that I don't want them to. And that's the design of Doe. The design of Doe is to give end users privacy for their DNS data, privacy we've never had before. Um, unlike DOT, it doesn't have its own port. DOE runs on 443. 443 is where all of the HTTPS traffic goes. It's completely commingled, and you can't figure out what is the DNS part of it and what is just the regular uh, 443 HTTPS traffic. That's by design, by the way. So the very first wide-scale implementation of DOE is Mozilla Firefox. And at the beginning of the year, or maybe it was the end of last year, they started describing how they were going to implement it. And the whole world freaked out. And it freaked out because it took away a lot of controls that service providers have and rely on to protect users and to run their network. You couldn't use the DNS anymore to comply with regulatory requirements. You couldn't use the DNS to do malware protection. And interestingly, as a service provider, you provide support for your users. Well, if a DOE resolver that Firefox has said you're going to use as a Firefox user, if it stops working, you're a regular end user, you're typing in www.whatever and nothing happens, it turns out you just assume your internet's broken. So you call your ISP. And you call your ISP and say, hey, the internet's broken. Can you fix my internet? Can you send somebody out? But they didn't break anything. Their service works fine. The problem is, is you're using a resolver that they don't have any control over, and they can't even see the queries that you're doing. Now, the DOE people say that's actually a feature, not a bug. But from a service provider perspective, that's actually a bad thing. The other thing we've learned this year is that ISPs do a lot of business on parental controls. Parental controls is actually a pretty big thing for them. And the easiest way to implement parental controls is in the DNS. But if your users aren't pointing to your recursive resolver anymore, those parental controls don't work. 
Uh, yeah, I also put under here, the ISPs often receive uh, court orders to block certain sites, as we've discussed, and they can't do that in um, a DOH world. If we step back from the service provider for a moment, we do have a little bit of public policy concerns here. If you set your resolver to 9.9.9.9, .9 where is that resolver located, the one that you're using? Is it here in Belgrade? Is it here in the Republic of Serbia? Is it in Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe? Is it in Europe at all? Law enforcement, prosecutors have some concerns here because when incidents happen and informa digital investigations have to occur, we've got multiple jurisdictions going on. And this is different than it's been in the past because in the past, Traditionally, when an end user does a DNS query, the recursive resolver that is used to capture that query and provide the answer to it typically has been located in the same country. Typically, it's located in the same AS because typically it's run by the service provider. Who gets to choose your resolver? Well, the whole point of ADD is you. The whole point is that the end user is supposed to say, this is who I trust the most. I trust my bank, so let me use my bank's Doe resolver. That's the whole point of Doe. But the problem is, not everybody's honest. What happens when the application maker, think about an application on your phone, think about a browser application, think about an operating system. If they're using Doe, and they choose the Doe resolver for you, have you really gotten any choice? Do you have, are you getting the privacy that you've requested? What if the application maker is not honest? What if they're using a resolver that steers queries away from where you're intending to go and instead sends them somewhere else? What if it's monetizing your data and doing so, of course, without your consent? They didn't ask you, hey, can we make money off your DNS data? Bad or dishonest implementations of DNS over HTTPS or DNS over TLS these can actually disempower end users. And it's a problem because it disempowers end users in a context that none of them understand, which is DNS resolution. We in this room understand DNS resolution. Nobody else in the rest of the city really understands it. We have three big implementations today of DOH. The first one is Mozilla Firefox. It's done some fine tuning over the year. Under the current rules of Firefox, um, DOH is on by default. This is part of their value add. If you use Firefox, guess what? We're going to protect you from the big bad ISPs that are monetizing your data. However, they've adjusted to some of the lessons we've learned earlier this year, and they said, look, we're going to do some auto detection, and if we figure out that um, organizations are, have their own policies, or if users, you have your own settings that you want, you can use the configuration to disable Doe when it interferes with your preferred policy. Uh, this fall, Google has started to uh, roll out Doe. Um, they do so very innocently. They simply do a check. Does the resolver that's in your network stack right now support Doe? If it does, it automatically points to the Doe resolver for that organization who you've chosen. And earlier this week, Microsoft has announced its implementation of Doe for Windows. And similar to how Google does it, um, they're also going to do some auto-detect to see if the user's resolver supports Doe. Interestingly, of course, it's an operating system, so it's implementing Doe at the operating system level. So one of the unintended side effects of applications doing their own DNS is this fear or this reality, depends on your point of view, that this is going to increase resolver centrality. The number of recursive resolvers in the world that are used by, are popularly used, continues to shrink. More queries go to less number of recursive resolvers. So our friends at APNIC were studying this this year and they asked themselves a question. How many resolvers would it take to cover 50% of all queries that we can measure. How you measure, by the way, really counts. Measuring this stuff is hard. 
they found, they did their measurements and they found it only took about eight or nine. And by far, the dominant recursive resolver in their studies was Google's 8.8.8.8. There were also some other big resolvers. Not surprisingly, most of them were in China and the United States. Um, during conversations about applications doing their own DNS, uh, Joe Abley, the chief technology officer of PIR, which runs .org, uh, he said, hey, look, I took a look in my authoritative server logs, and I found for the entire .org domain that two dozen resolver systems are responsible for 80% of all the queries for .org. That's a lot of centralized recursive service. Uh, he looked at Google and he said somewhere between 15 and 20% of all the queries to .org go through 8.8.8.8. So look, public DNS, centralized DNS, can be a very, very good thing. It depends on who you are and it depends on where you are. We're network operators here. Think about when you're building internet. You are concentrating on what? Building out fiber. You're spending a lot of your time dealing with interconnect. You want better transit and better peering. You are worried about service operations. Do I have frontline support for my users? You're worried about organizational matters. Oh, and by the way, you gotta sell this thing too, right? It's a lot of time, it's a lot of time and a lot of work to run an ISP or to run any service provider. What public DNS does that's really nice for the service providers, especially smaller ones or ones in developing nations, is it takes them having to worry about recursive resolution out of the equation. You simply point your users to 9.9.9.9. You point your users to 1.1.1.1. You point your users to somewhere where someone's already built out an infrastructure for you, already has the expertise to make it fast, and it costs you no money because you're not going to make any money off this stuff. It's just a cost center for you. So public DNS is really, really good, especially in developing nations. The problem, though, is we have a smaller number, a larger number of queries going to a smaller number of players. And that prompts uh, quite a few concerns. One of, that is, one of them is it gives them a lot of power. Um, I work for ICANN. We spend a whole lot of time trying to evangelize and popularize DNSSEC. One of the biggest allies we've had in rolling out DNSSEC is Google. Google's been highly, highly supportive of DNSSEC. Well, what happens if they change their mind? What happens if they turn DNSSEC validation for some reason off on 8.8.8.8? .8 the statistics go plumbly. The amount of DNSSEC validation that's possible goes down. Over-centralized recursive service prompts other questions. Content filtering. You know, in the social media world, they've, tried, they've worked really hard, or they've struggled, I should say, with filtering. Twitter comes out a few weeks ago and says, we're not going to allow political ads anymore. Well, in order to do that, they've got to figure out filters for that. And it's actually kind of hard, and arguably, they've not done a very good job of that. But compared to DNS, Twitter is nothing. There are trillions and trillions of queries every single day in the DNS. And if more and more of these queries go to a smaller number of players, and these players start to do content filtering on that, that's a whole lot more impactful than a social media company trying to do content filtering. The internet works. The internet has worked over the last 40 years because we've built it cooperatively. We use the IANA namespace, generally. We use and we buy into the IANA number space. We've set up a bottoms-up, multi-stakeholder model where we're actually empowered as network operators to make sure this thing runs properly. Because if it doesn't run properly, we can change it. It's not top down, it's bottoms up. But when you have more and more recursive service in the hands of smaller and smaller players, you can lose this. This is at risk. Two more quick things. The whole goal of applications doing their, DNA, do, doing their own DNS, the whole goal of encrypting the transport channel is to give end users privacy. But if we want to give them privacy, why are we redirecting more and more queries to a smaller number of players? And many of these players, by the way, are in jurisdictions that don't have strong end user privacy regulations. 8.8.8.8, the most popular DNS service in the world, is, how, is run by a company housed in the United States. If the US government decides something's going to happen, 
That's going to happen. The U.S. Government, the US, US law doesn't have strong data, end user data regulations. Yet we're putting more and more and more of our end user data into 8.8.8.8. So, final thoughts. This thing's very new, okay? DOH only became a protocol a year ago last month. It's 13 months old. That's not very old. On, that's not very old for a technology. So we're, this is new. We're learning. One of the things we're learning is that implementation, implementation details matter. The DOE implementation that Firefox announced a year ago is a whole lot different than what they announced today. DNS privacy is something we figured out as a community we want. It's something end users want, and it's something regulators have decided they want. So encrypting DNS data with TLS, encrypting it in HTTPS, moving to new things like DNS over quick, these are all good. These are all good for society. These are good for the internet. But how you do it matters. So that's applications doing their own DNS. That's DOT and DOH. If you have any questions. Okay, we have a couple questions from the audience. We're just waiting for the microphones. Uh, hello. Okay, so I'm kind of confused by your presentation. Okay. At one level, you're saying that we're giving DNS control to smaller governments, smaller ISPs, decentralization. And at one point, you say that's bad because governments don't have maybe data privacy laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then at second point, you say that Google is the largest DNS provider. And then again, you say that it's US based and because United States can <coughs> enforce some laws, scrub the site of the internet. So I'm confused there. Are you pro decentralization or against decentralization? I'm not pro or against it. I'm not here to advocate for it or advocate for, against it. What I'm saying is that we've decided as an internet community that it's probably a good idea to encrypt this, this, this channel between the device and the recursive resolvers. And this is probably a good thing. I, I hope everyone thinks this is a good thing. It is. Yeah. The problem is the unintended consequences, where what we have is the reality of public DNS that is a centralized thing. It's good in some contexts. It's really good in developing nations. It's really good in Africa, okay? It's bad in other ways. It's bad, it, it's like counterproductive to say, we all believe this is good to encrypt the transport channel. But if it has the consequence of moving more and more and more things into resolvers that, don't, that are in countries that don't have good end user data privacy regulations, well, maybe that's not so good. It's not a binary thing here. It's complex. And it, as, a, as operators, as protocol developers, as internet users, and as decision makers, we have to consider all of this when we think about how we want to build our, our networks, how we want to build our service providers, services uh, in the way that's best for our users and best for the internet. I don't have an answer for you because I'm, I'm not trying to answer that question. I'm just saying is this is hard. What's cool is that we've changed our mind in just a year. A year ago, Firefox, the very first to the market on Doe, said everyone's going to use Doe and this is how you're going to use it. And then a couple of people said, no, wait, 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 I've got a problem with that. And so they fixed it. And so it's something that we're going to learn as we go. And my point of standing up here is not to tell you where we should go, it's just to talk about what we need to think about as we're getting there. That's all. So in some, I don't know, scenario, we, can, we could say that the long run solution or goal should be DOH implementation across the board, and then we can talk about centralization and decentralization. Yeah, whether it's DOT, whether it's DOH, one of the new protocols that's going to come out of the IETF is DNS over QUIC. Whatever it is that we have that provides good, better privacy, this is probably a good thing. And then what we do with that is figure out what are the unintended consequences and how can we make them better? Because that's what we do. That's what we do. You think about transit and peering 10 years ago. You think about transit and peering 20 years ago. It was a complete, we did it completely differently than we do today because we figured out better ways to engineer it. One of the other goals of my talk that I probably doesn't really come through well in the slides 
is that it's better if we fix it. It's better if we as network operators, and for those of us in the audience who work on protocol engineering, it's better if we fix it and not make it, and, and any screw ups we have, it's better if we fix it now because the governments are more and more interested in fixing it themselves, and that's really bad for technology. So, okay, we have another question here. So, <coughs> you said uh, about, <coughs> sorry, about uh, using it in a small Africa state. So, uh, sorry. So, we can use it something like universal service, like, universal service, like universal phone or internet service, like only for the pure part. So not to use it in emerging uh, markets on, on, on the markets that are now uh, bigger. Like because the industry started with uh, destroying uh, incumbents. So ex ante regulation put this industry and we are now on the other side. Because now the, uh, the industry that started is uh, making, making like the biggest monopole, bigger monopole that, that incumbent providers were on in the 90s, maybe. So my point about where public DNS is good in developing countries is more just about thinking about what it takes to operate a network. In order to set up your own recursive resolution for all your users, you've got a lot that you've got to know. And especially in a developing nation, you may not have a lot of staff. And where you have to spend that staff's time is on building the things that actually sustain the network and in some cases help you make money. DNS doesn't help you generally, it's not supposed to anyway. DNS is not for there for you to make money. DNS is supposed to be a core service. But in 2019, DNS is a whole lot more complex than it used to be. There are 250 or so RFCs covering 2,500 pages of material about the DNS protocol now. So it's a lot harder and you have to, you, it's a specialty now. Mm -hmm. So the, whole, the only point I was trying to make was that public DNS is really good in those circumstances because you can just point your end users to 9.9.9.9 and it works. It works well for them, it works quickly for them and it costs you no money. It, you're right, we, we did start off the internet with a whole bunch of incumbent carriers and we've broken those up nicely. National telcos, while they're still a thing in some countries, it's, they're not a thing in most countries anymore. Not, not like they used to be. And this is a good thing. It's a good thing for consumer choice. But public DNS and these types of things really do have a place. Hello? One question, please. So, um, Zoran from uh, Program Committee. Uh, both uh, Jarko, myself, and Nenad uh, try really hard to bring uh, relevant people to discuss this issue of privacy. Eventually, Google did not come. We contacted them, we contacted the right people. Uh, okay, it was a short notice. And they reacted like, oh, sorry, you should have called us three months earlier. But eventually, Cloudflare is here, Quad9 is here, but Google is not here and they are the biggest. So that leaves me to a question. DOH, DOT is a transport protocol. Yes. Who do we trust to do the resolving? How can we, uh, the DNS operator, it's just a transport protocol, yeah. but then do we trust Cloudflare? Do we trust Quad9? Do we trust the incumbent? Do we trust China Telecom? It is a question of trust. And how we are going to establish that trust? That is my question. Yeah. You're asking me an impossible question, of course, because most end users don't know what we're talking about. Uh, my friend in the back, whose name I'm sorry I don't know, my friend in the back made a really interesting point during the coffee break. End users don't care. End users just want it to work. They don't know what DNS resolution is. They don't know what UDP and TCP are. They don't know what QUIC is. They have no idea what Quad9 is. They've, they have heard of Google, and a scary number of them have heard of 8.8.8.8, okay? Who do you trust? Look, we're very smart men and women in this room. You have to make that, we all have to make that decision ourselves. We have to make the decision on our home computers for ourselves, for our families, for our children. But you know what? I've been doing this for 21 years. This is my iPhone. Do you know what I can't do on my iPhone? Set my recursive resolver. It's not a feature. Nowhere in the, for the Android users, you're looking at me like, what? Switch to Android. Yeah, yeah, switch to Android. 
but I like the iPhone. It's got the games I want. But that's how it works, right? I'm a smart internet engineer. I, use, I choose to use a device that I cannot choose the recursive resolver. So what I guess is I, the answer, my answer to your question is presently I'm trusting, well, I'm on the Wi-Fi, so that's not working. Um, MTS. I'm choosing MTS. So MTS, thank you. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much.